Hello everybody and welcome to a, I don't know what I'm going to call this yet. Uh, this is honestly the first time I'm doing a more or less kind of definitive analysis on poetry, but I want to call it something different and I haven't really thought of anything yet. Uh, but as I get this uh, ready to put up, I'm sure uh, I'll have to come up with something, right? So uh, stay tuned. We are doing the first poem here today that I've ever done with these videos, but boy have we picked a rather lengthy one, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, and um, an important poem. What some people would consider, especially people who love to follow the genres, uh, uh, the different eras of poetry, and, and uh, artistic expression in general that we've gone through, uh, people would say this is the beginning of modernism in literature. And T.S. Eliot, also kind of known as one of the heavyweights when it comes to poetry establishing a, obviously a kind of modern style, a, a, a modern sense of what the content might be uh, and what we can kind of expect. Um, this poem is said to uh, uh, start all of that off and it really starts with just the first, uh, the second and the third line which we'll get to in just a second. But before that, the only thing worth mentioning here is we obviously have something that begins before the actual poem. We're start, we start off with uh, uh, some Italian taken from Dante's Inferno. And if you've never had the, pl the privilege or the pleasure, I guess I could say, of reading Dante's Inferno, long story short, Dante, you're, 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 you're I think, earnest, uh, a, a kind of faithful individual, right? Especially when you consider that time period, the prevalence of religion in people's lives. Hey, you're pretty much good, you know, a, a good Catholic or whatever it would be, um, is brought through the kind of uh, ethereal, companion of uh, Virgil, who is this kind of, I believe, Greek poet that is more or less a spirit uh, that is bringing uh, uh, Dante through, he gets this wonderful experience, the 13 layers of hell. And every layer, uh, every level that we're on speaks to a certain type of sinner and a certain type of punishment. And the important thing about all of this, I guess a couple of things. One is, it's literally a tour through hell. And then the second part of this is, uh, uh, not that there's much time in the uh, actual epic poem, Dante's Inferno, uh, given to this, but Dante gets to return to Earth. And nobody knows he went on this trip and he kind of comes back and it forces him to look at people differently. Uh, definitely creating, I think, a bit of a disconnect between Dante and the rest of these people knowing the outcome of so many of these people's lives. Um, and I think it definitely is probably supposed to be a cautionary tale, right? When you think about the idea of our real life consequences uh, uh, being met with this place, these places in hell, right? And the things that, because of the things that we've done wrong. But Dante gets to come back. Dante will therefore see humanity, the people uh, uh, that reside alongside him on the planet in, in a very different way. And that is the most important idea to extract from this as we are brought on a journey with uh, a old, I want to say old, uh, but an, uh, an, an older seeming man uh, who uh, has a certain question on his mind here. And I think sometimes we forget the context of why we call this the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, all right? So it really starts, so after we get that Dante, that wonderful, important Dante reference out of the way, let us go then, you and I, first lines. Notice that he is, we have a second person kind of narration here. It's actually addressing a you. It doesn't happen oh so often in the poem, but it's a quick reminder. Who is the you? That's what I always ask my students right away when we look at this poem. And um, it could be the reader. Obviously, it's always the reader to some extent, but it also is contextually a woman that this man, Alfred Prufrock, is going to propose to. All right, so that's kind of the, the literal narrative to the story is this, this guy who wants to propose to a woman and yet he's met with so much kind of fear and, and apprehension along the way trying to meet that literal goal of proposing, which is no easy feat, right? Uh, I guess we could say, uh, especially if you don't know what the 
outcome might be, right? It definitely might make you quite nervous in the asking of that question uh, and the expression of your love for this person. Now, also another thing to start off with right away is name symbolism. Alfred translates to sage and wise. And though this character, Prufrock, seems riddled with anxiety, I think there's also perhaps we could argue a certain sageness and a certain wiseness to his perspectives, his beliefs here, right? As we start to look at some details. So sage and wise for Alfred. Now, Prufrock is a, from what I've learned, can't claim I, I came up with this, but I've, I've heard this before. It's a combination of two different things. One is P-R-U, which reminds us of certain words like prudence, to be prudent, which really means to be careful and even worrisome to that, to, a, to, a, to an extent. Uh, about the present so that we make better decisions about the future. You can see why this word is associated with being prude. We hear this a lot in our younger lives, perhaps high school, college, to be prude. Well, yeah, to be prude is a thing. It means to be very careful in the present term, right? With relationships, etc., actions, experiences, because you're, you're worried about the long term, right? And, and how things are gonna turn out, what conditions you might face long term. So it speaks to a certain mindset. And frock is really very literal. It's, it's a frock coat, which is a certain type of heavy kind of black coat. Doesn't have to be black, probably. Maybe gray, maybe brown, who knows. Um, but it's a religious coat. So we bring together this idea of prudence along with this idea of religion, right? And that can, we can keep that quite general, I guess, right? The idea of religion. But an interesting combination of ideas here as we start off. Now, where modernism, and I think I must have gotten this from the Arena BBC series, British Broadcasting Series, uh, company series, and they have a, 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 a series they do, I don't think they, they do it anymore, so these have been around for a long time, called Arena, and it's about authors. And they did one on T.S. Eliot, and it was pretty good. And I think this is where I picked up some of this information. But modernism, and in terms of a... Uh, movement in art and it's a turn away from romanticism and it's very important to note here modernism is a turn from almost an aversion of uh, romanticism romanticism just think about what it means to be romantic right um, it means to place an emphasis on the ideal how good things could be I like to always reference a romantic comedy when we talk about romance and the ideal because in real life those types of characters, like the, the buffoons, can't hold a job. Think of like an Adam, Adam Sandler film where he plays so many of these characters. That, that, that person, that figure in real life doesn't get the outstanding catch, the man or woman waiting on the other side, right? Um, but in the romantic comedies, they do because it's this wishful thinking, it's idealism. Uh, what could be, right? Uh, and seeing that through, right, in terms of a possibility. Modernism is going to be much more based on the evidence that surrounds us, right? Can we really keep our hopes high when the reality that we're living in doesn't really suggest those lofty ideas, right? Doesn't really, really, uh, uh, is not really compatible with those ideas. And so modernism, once again, is a rejection of idealism, romanticism, right? For what's really happening, what's, re what's really going on. And the entry into this, I guess you could say, perspective in writing comes in lines two and three here. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table, it's very counterintuitive. A romantic point of view would say, let's go walk and enjoy the sunset or enjoy the evening, right? The early evening. But then the third line here, the simile that Eliot gives us, like a patient etherized upon a table, We've taken what should have been something very romantic and pleasant, right? Uh, and now we've turned it into something rather different. And what it is, is a patient etherized upon a table. A great just general definition for etherized is going to be to be made numb. So we're really speaking to a numbness. And right off the bat, you know, you think about the era. I'm looking at the publication date of this poem, 1920. Coming out, uh, he is a British citizen at this point in time. He was actually born in America, St. Louis, when it was still kind of a bustling frontier town. 
And now, uh, or after that, I should say, he felt more in tune with his British blood uh, and, and, and moved there and took up work and citizenship in that country. But in any case, he's speaking to a European perspective in 1920, post-World War I, in this idea of being numb. Numb to what, we would ask, right? What could you be numb to considering the bigger picture at hand here? But here we have this, this etherized patient upon a table, and that's supposed to be your evening sky. So we're saying goodbye to romanticism, right? We're kind of, we're kind of letting it fall into the distance here in exchange for different imagery. Moving on. Um, where, do, where does he want to take us? Just like Dante, Virgil says, come with me, the narrator here, right, uh, Prufrock, is saying, come with me. And where is he suggesting this woman or us as readers, but, you know, kind of interchangeable there, where do we need to go? We need to go into like the streets themselves. And just to mention a couple things, restless nights in one night cheap hotels. Whatever you want to say of those locations, even the language like restless gives us a sense of maybe how the narrator is feeling here, right? Uh, or some, some general feeling that might be suggested here, a certain kind of restlessness. Uh, sawd uh, sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. We, it's funny because I teach and, and I, I, I am a consultant uh, for AP literature. And when you look at like their units and their skills, they don't put setting on poetry. Setting, they don't really, it's, I guess they don't see it as a huge skill that needs to be looked at when dealing with poetry. But in this poem, setting matters because we have these contrasting settings. And the first one that we actually get some, some language for is out on the streets, kind of in these more grimier part of towns, uh, parts of town uh, with a certain kind of uh, population, right? Uh, and that's gonna be contrasted with where is Prufrock throughout kind of all this time, even at the end when we seem to kind of scatter more into his mind, kind of retreat more into his mind with the mermaids and all these other things we get toward the end, he is at a really kind of, I guess you could say ritzy, definitely up, upper scale cocktail party. And that's why there's all these people, the women coming and going, speaking of Michelangelo, we're at a cocktail party, right? And probably with affluent people, people who are not found in some of the early descriptions that we get here, like these saw, you know, sawdust restaurants and these cheap hotels, this is a very different kind of clientele, right? a very different kind of people. We get out of this uh, first stanza, let us go and make our visit, very similar to Virgil, right? Come with me, Dante, right? So you can see why he starts with that allusion here. In the, the very famous refrain here, in the room, and the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Now, whenever I teach this, I always like to say, okay, people, who is Michelangelo? And people give very accurate, educated responses, right? The Renaissance artist who uh, uh, represents the pinnacle of human achievement. He's not the only one, right? There's the other few. But I always like to interject and say, no, no, we know that's not true. We're talking about the Ninja Turtle, right? And it's it's, it's my big joke, all right? Um, I think growing up, I was very, 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 if I would have read this poem as a kid, I would have been like, oh, we are talking about the Ninja Turtles, right? Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, but of course, it, uh, all jokes aside, what is Michelangelo? This is worth noting. It's a connection to the Renaissance, right? Which feels like, seems like, the pinnacle of human achievement. When we go back to these eras of, uh, of human endeavor, the big strides that we made in terms of perhaps philosophy, science, art, etc., that represent, worth noting, the best of us, the, the most uh, aspirational uh, a, 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 a part of ourselves, right, that, that wants to be virtuous and, and, and work towards noble causes that brings people together, right, and explores the achievements of people. Um, that's all related, right, in that one word or that one proper noun, Michelangelo, right? It's all there. And you see what the women are doing at this cocktail party. They're going from room to room talking about this great figure, which is to talk about that great era. But remember that they're living in, let's say, early 1900s, right? Publication date of 1920. They're not living in the Renaissance period, 
but yet they go from room to room hearkening back to these times of former human greatness. And what does that contrast with? You could say, what does it compare with? Maybe they're feeling in this party, right? Everything's very upscale, everything's put together, everything's where it should be. So you could make those comparisons, but what does it contrast with? What does that era, the enlightenment of human greatness contrast with? World War I. Especially post-World War I, as we come out and finally get to survey the, the pure human devastation at hand. And we start to see all of the cruelty and, and utmost uh, a, a destructive potential that human beings can have toward each other, right? When we start to see the, the machine guns. Uh, one thing that maybe people will make a reference to in a moment, the mustard gas, right? And then these things are used with the intention of causing so much harm and death only to be retracted, right? Like, oh, you can't do that in future wars. But notice it never stopped people from doing it in the first place, right? These drives to kill each other are immense and widespread. Another thing to remember, we talk about the losses coming out of World War I. World War II will be even more staggering, especially for certain countries. But World War I is, is equally as devastating as we see machines of killing starting to be used for the first time and what that leads to, right? Real, uh, 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 real huge losses. We could go on and on about that, right? But notice the contrast. They want to talk about Michelangelo, but think about the world as is here. I'll try to be quick with the next stanza. Yellow fog. What does this yellow fog seem to be doing? It is outside this party, and it almost seems like it's rubbing its, it's likened to, you can't really call it personification because it's not likened to a person but it does feel metaphorically like a cat or a vermin of some kind. Uh, I think it could be a combination of things, right? This yellow smoke. Some students like to think mustard gas. Sure, that could be an idea. It speaks to the, the level of human cruelty and death, right? And killing that we get in World War I. Um, but I think it also should just be really noted for how it seems to want to be seen, right? To a certain extent stays outside where it belongs, lingered upon the pools and stand in drains, lets fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. It's very much at home with filth. It's very much at home with this kind of soot in this very grimy environment. It seems to be thriving, in fact. And one last detail I like to point out here is the end, because you get this kind of potential kinetic, or I should say kinetic potential energy that kind of takes place. It slips by the terrace, the smoke like into a cat, really, right? You should all know, write this down, T.S. Eliot was a cat person, right? Uh, in fact, like the, um, uh, what is it? I forget the, the name of the person who put cats together, and I don't want to say the, last, uh, the wrong name, but the musical cats, a lot of that is uh, based on uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, love of cats as well. He wrote a, a book of poems, I believe, or essays, something along those lines, all about cats, right? He loved cats cats. He was a cat guy. So was Philip K. Dick. All right? So a lot of authors love their cats. How do you feel about cats? I like cats pretty much, but they're, they get older and they're a little bit more maintenance, right? I'm keeping up with this stuff every day. I love my bandita. All right, back to this, but very much in home in this uh, kind of sooty environment. And uh, what does it do though? It's about to jump. It's about to make a leap. But what does it then do? It curls. This is line 22. Curls once about the house and falls asleep. It gives up. It, it had this, 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 this uh, urgency. It had this drive to do something, make that leap, and it didn't do it. A good literal way to understand that in the poem is to make the proposal. I'm going to do it. I'm going to Oh, I'm not going to do it. Right? And then the chance comes up. Okay, this is my turn. I'm going to do it. Mm, fall asleep. Right? Or just delay, postpone the impending issue. And so that speaks to one of the themes of this story, which is definitely, uh, I guess you could say procrastination, uh, based on a certain kind of anxiety and apprehension, right? Not being able to make a decision. Put your hand up out there if you overthink a lot of things. Right? I overthink probably a lot of things in my life and it leads to more dismay, right? My inability maybe even to follow through with things and make a decision. That's proof rock in a nutshell. And maybe that's part of the prudence. Uh, being very careful and worrisome 
intentional in the moment so that you don't disrupt some idea of the future, right? Some, some prospect for yourself. So it could speak to the name. Next up, and indeed there will be time. You have to read into this line. It will be repeated a few, a few times. Uh, you have to read into this very ironically. He says there will be time. We've all been there. Uh, there'll be time to get this homework assignment done. There'll be time to put this material together. There'll be time to film this lecture, whatever it's going to be, right? And there really is, truthfully, people, no time. It speaks to that Cinderella syndrome, uh, the 1159, right? Something's got to happen because there really is no time, right? Everything changes by 12 midnight for Cinderella. And if something doesn't happen, she doesn't have that dance. She doesn't meet that man. She doesn't fall in love and get that to reciprocate by 12 a.m. Guess what? It's all for naught. And that's the way to think about this poem and really a lot of literature that you read is that urgency. And here he's telling himself there will be time. No, there won't, right? Especially when you consider the bigger picture here, the broader context of the, the world. Um, he didn't really predict World War II. That would still be, let's say, 10, 15 years off, right? Uh, into the future. But you can see he's trying to maybe present this urgency what we just got out of, what's happening now, our response to it, our attitudes toward it. Maybe there is no time, right? And this is something we need to urgently address. Uh, all right, very good. Um, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, you know, very easy to see this idea of a certain false exterior, uh, maybe even faking your emotions in a social or public way, right, in order to hide what's truly the feelings on the inside. We talk about murder and create a sharp contradiction here, right? Um, create maybe in terms of art, expression, murder could be the same thing, but also reminds us of the physical murder, right? You know, you can ask, you can ask these thematic questions. We're, we're not, uh, it's not like we're disallowed to ask these questions, right? We can ask these questions such as when a soldier kills at war, is it something different than murder or or is it murder in your mind and Elliot might be getting an idea across right the murder that has taken place that's just one context we talk about World War one but a, but a major context it could come in other ways uh, a certain disregard for certain people within a society rich versus poor affluent versus those who struggle uh, to hold on right and to maintain a way of life um, so it could be murder, death, in a, in a couple different ways at least, right? Uh, moving on, on to the second page, right? At least as far as my copy is concerned. And we get the, uh, just to mention some of the diction here, indecisions, visions, and revisions. And we all know what it means to be indecisive. You cannot make a decision. And I, I know I'm capable of this in maybe trivial ways and maybe more major ways in my life too, but. I don't know which one of the thing to get on Amazon. Do I get the blue one? Do I get the yellow one? I don't know, right? Um, so that's just indecision, not being able to make a decision. Literally, in this poem, being able to propose, is this the proper time? Am I ready to do this, right? Uh, but there's always the bigger picture here. And I think it's a little too early to really get into it, so we'll just keep covering a little bit more. Visions and revisions. I have a vision of a certain idea, but now I'm going to revise it. And that's not a problem. I mean, I teach creative writing, so I really do think revision is key, right? It's one of the most important stages of what we can do after we get feedback from whoever it might be, or even our own kind of ideas. We revise, right? That's a big way that we improve our work. But it also can have a disadvantage, which is to delay, 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 right? How, how often are you going to revise that resume before you just send it out and, and, and actually see if it's going to be effective, right? How often must you revise before you commit or take action, right? Um, it reminds me of some ideas, not to get into too much detail, but like Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, his idea of praxis, which is a combination of reflection and action. And revision is a lot of reflection. You're changing things. But at some point, you've got to move forward from that, right? There's got to be some action. Last line of that stanza. This would be line 34. Uh, before the taking of toast and tea, I had a colleague 
mention uh, his 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 experience connected more to the idea of the coffee spoons, but very similar. The routines of our lives, and specifically perhaps the routines of the lives of the affluent and the, the well-off or the fairly well-off, right? Where your life really is every day, go to work, grab a Starbucks or brew that coffee at home. Either way, it costs money, money that we have to remember some people in society don't have. You put your creamer in it. Some of us are just kind of you know, we got everything that we need. It's a part of our routine. And it could be this routine that creates a certain complacency within the world, right? And we just kind of go along with other people's opinions, perhaps, right? Um, right after that, to speak to that level of complacency, we get the refrain, which means a perfect repeat of lines. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. A wonderful rhyme. Um, remember, this is not just a breaking from romanticism in terms of content, but also form. There is no rhyme scheme to this poem. I just got done teaching a lot of this with creative writing. We did some sonnets. Uh, and we're even doing, you know, lyric poetry. Um, but especially the sonnets and stuff, there's a very strict form that has to be uh, adhered to. Not the case here, right? Content is taking priority over form but you still see some of the nice rhyme and it's so unforced and that's how rhymes should ideally sound is is not to really sound too forced and i think he does a good job with that but it's the refrain to remind us of the enlightenment here's your toast and tea your starbucks for the morning and now you get to think about how wonderful humanity is right and all of our achievements it seems to go hand in hand and indeed, there will be time. Line 36. Remember, ironically, people, there is no time. Do I dare? Do I dare? Very literally, do I propose to this woman? Do I go back and go back down the stairs with a bald spot in the middle of my hair? And then the use of parentheses, they will say how his hair is growing thin. Important to analyze the use of parentheses in this poem just because it is used very sparingly. Um, and it really seems to represent his feelings of being judged, right? Seen for the very weak physical state that he seems to have based on his description here. And this is creating an anxiety. Oh, people are going to look at me. They're going to see my, uh, what does he mention here? The bald spot in the hair. Uh, they are going to see um, the, the thin arms and legs. He doesn't feel, in terms of an exterior, is concerned, very strong and very appealing. And I think this is a wonderful time to draw a striking comparison, or a contrast, I should say, to something that has been alluded to, but you know, it's easy to get a, a visual image in your mind. Think about Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, not the Ninja Turtles. I wish we could talk about the Ninja Turtles all day long. Go read the original comics if you haven't. They're quite creative. And well done, the Eastman and Laird. They sold the rights to Nickelodeon, I think, within the last five to ten years. And I'm sure they are doing quite well for themselves, right? Um, but anyways, notice the contrast. When we talk about Michelangelo, you think of the sculptures that these men created. The bodies that they put on display. Very muscular, very vol uh, 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 volume of voluminous, right? A lot of kind of, you know, dense bodies, very filled out, strong. You think about some of the, the male bodies, right, that they would show. Um, notice the exact opposite is the way he's describing his own body. The sculptures by these Enlightenment uh, uh, creators were magnificent. His body is almost a living description of despair and a, a, a destitute world, right? Notice that's how his body comes across, thin. And I think this is when you have to remember the reality of this time period, coming out of World War I and seeing the horror laid out before you, right, of, of what people can do to each other, especially in the European context, right, especially within that European context. Um, his thinness, the baldness is a world that is almost fading out, and his body is an expression of that. Lines 45, 46, do I dare disturb the universe? What a crazy question. You know, I always remind my students here, you know, he's just proposing. And even when I proposed to my wife, um, I never had the thought that I was disturbing the universe in some kind of way. So it really does speak to the profound intentions 
of this need to either propose or I think in a more figurative manner to state an idea uh, uh, that you are afraid to share with others, right? Perhaps even yourself, who knows? But being afraid to share things. And this will bring us into the next few stanzas, right? Uh, um, and this is where we get into a lot of that anxiety and apprehension. You know, the, this is an idea that we can all relate to. And that's, I think, the goal of a, a teacher, professor, facilitator, instructor, whatever you want to call it, is to help people relate in their own ways to the profound ideas of these poems. And, you know, maybe you were at work. Maybe uh, uh, it was at school. You were working on a group project. Who knows? Maybe this is something within the family. But you really had a good idea about something, a very different approach. Maybe people had it, all these different ideas that seem like one way of handling a situation and you were like, man, I got a really different idea here. But you also felt a bit nervous to share the idea. Like people would shoot you down, like people would judge you. And there's one of the big themes that we get out of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is that feeling of being judged. That feeling of going out on a limb, presenting a very different point of view, right, or opinion, uh, and then facing the consequences for that. And these next lines really seem to give us those ideas. Um, the first before that, though, starting with line 49, here's where we get just what seems to be a, a, a kind of mundane yet very comfortable routine. And it might speak to T.S. Eliot's life before kind of organically, I would say, finding his way into poetry, right? He worked in banking. Uh, and then after that, he got into like, publishing, editing. And then he became a poet from there, right? A very good poet, I guess. I haven't read too much of his stuff. Um, but this poem is very good. So he was used to that affluent life. I mean, this guy was pretty well off, right? Working in those industries, he was doing all right. So he was used to a very comfortable, yet perhaps a very, in a way, silenced life. When you grow so accustomed to the comfort and the convenience that you grow numb, and there's that, that patient etherized upon a table, you become numb to the true suffering of the world, the real despair that lies outside these ritzy parties, right? Uh, and the real despair and loss that is we've experienced in the world. I think we have to jump to that huge context, right? Always, uh, as we read through this poem. But it's not easy doing that. Who wants to give that up? I know the voices. This is lines uh, 53 and 54. Um, or 52, 53, I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. It's the music, which I think we can also uh, 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 parallel with the idea of Michelangelo, this beautiful, probably music that again represents kind of the high points of human achievement and it's blaring through the rooms. But what is it trying to do or what is it effectively doing? It's covering up all of the dying voices. This wonderful ideology, romanticism, right? Being stuck in the past, looking at these great achievements of humanity and, and, and replaying this. Put the, putting the, you can think of the music as just kind of replaying those ideas over and over, especially for the upper class, especially for the upper class. There's so much to gain, perhaps, from hearkening back to these worlds, it re, uh, these times, right? These, these things that we learn about. It reminds me of what a student taught me in one of my classes once, which was, um, this would make sense because you think about a lot of people accessing education at that time, especially higher education, whether it be men or, or, or women, men or women, um, it was probably people with money. So this world of learning, learning about the enlightenment, all this, it really kind of helps to develop the mindset of the affluent classes who then become numb to the real world around them, right? So there's a really interesting way of putting this all together, which still speaks to modern day implications as well, right? Is that how the university systems work? Is that how the uh, Ivy League institutions work, right? Cutting a certain kind of group of people off from real concerns of everyday people in the world around us. Could be, right? From there, there comes the, the anxiety and he likens himself to being one of those bugs on a pin. I remember going in one of those rooms where they study bugs. Uh, is it epistemology, a pit or something like that? I'm not sure, I probably got that wrong. Um, but the study of bugs, so they'll have them all kind of on these pins. They're usually dead by the time they let people look at these things, but who knows, right? But that's what it feels like here. That's what he's creating in terms of a very 
eerie, creepy, uh, and very, I guess you could say earthly uh, uh, kind of imagery, right? A bug sprawling, still moving, still alive on a pin. And the feelings that a lot of students will often share here is kind of nowhere to go, a certain vulnerability, uh, you're, you're trapped, you're literally stuck, and everybody can now stare at you, right? Um, how should I begin to spit out the butt ends of my days and ways? Butt ends means cigarette butts. And everybody was a smoker back in this time period. It's unfortunate. Nobody was really championing the health benefits of, of, of really doing away with cigarettes, right? And kind of, you know, keeping yourself from uh, uh, that poison. But um, what it just means though is nobody, I used to be a smoker a long time ago. You don't like the butts. The butt ends are gross. That's what stinks and like, uh, it's a shame that we have to even put those things anywhere because they, they seem very toxic, it's gross. And that's what he's saying, how do I let out that part of my life, those feelings that I can essentially equate with the butt ends of a cigarette? How do I express this? And perhaps in this poem that is breaking from romanticism in terms of imagery, in terms of content, in terms of so many things, form as well, Maybe that's what he, he is doing. He's, he's expressing the most dire and dreary aspects of his life. This is, a, you know, I think there is definitely major hope at the end once we recognize how to analyze some of these illusions. But it's not a, a very pretty picture for Prufrock here, right? All of this Feelings anxiety, about his, his physicality, right? His capabilities here. It, it is quite dreary. Um, now, what has he known? All the braceleted arms, white and bare, and then we get the sparing use of parentheses, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. And this is separating the ideal from the reality. What is the reality once the lamplight is there, which could speak to an aspect of real objective truth? an objective look at the world as is, without lying to ourselves that we are these great people in a society, right, when we really start to look at the problems that exist, and we could easily make that argument for today. Are we really a great advanced civilization when we have this much poverty, uh, when we have this much greed, uh, when we have this much war, ongoing conflict in the world? Um, can we really pat ourselves on the back based on what's really occurring here, right? And that's what the light brown hair is. It's a woman's, look at my arm right the hair now if you're a woman ideally i guess the thing is you don't want this hair the bracelets are there to cover up uh, uh the truth right as well as the ideas of being white and bare which speaks to usually on a symbolic level innocence and purity right things look very decorated and ornate and innocent on the outside but once that light is on right in the, in the kind of shaded uh, uh, part, you know, in, in, the sh in the shadows, but once that light is on, the truth is at hand. The, the arm is much more human looking, much more human looking. And this will connect to some of the last illusions we get, namely the, uh, uh, the mermaids, right, that come at the very end. All right, but this is the real arm. And then we get a couple lines right after that that speak to this idea of being distracted and not seeing things for what they truly are. And these are very, uh, uh, very poetic, very uh, memorable lines, I think. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Is it the alluring odor of a woman that makes me forget, or, or at least kind of gets me off topic, right, in terms of the apprehension and the anxiety I was just shedding light on, right? Is it that perfume that takes me away from all of that, right, the wonderful uh, uh, a scent of a, of, of a nice perfume or cologne that covers up and distracts us from the truth at hand here, right? Um, all right, very good. We have a section break there. And then we move into, shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets. And this is when we go back outside the party. You think about situationally, he is still in the party. That's where he is. But now he's saying, should I say that I've been the, to these other places and seen these things? And what do we get? Narrow streets, a certain kind of confinement. This is not where the affluent uh, individuals of this party go and spend time, right? This is a different part of society, a different part of town. And obviously, I think he's speaking to London here, right? Because that's where he lived. Should he say he 
Watch the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, a certain kind of loneliness. When you have ideas that, are differ, from, that differ from the norm, especially political, social, right, economic ideals, um, you can feel quite isolated. You can feel quite lonely, not to just mention the loneliness of the general population outside of this party, right? There is a lot of loneliness out there. Next lines, my uh, uh, James Reagan, the poetry director at USC when I went there for professional writing, hope he's doing well. Um, he said this was his two favorite lines in all of poetry, so I'll read them verbatim. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floor of silent seas. He doesn't even say I should have been a crab, which is what this feels like it is, right? Some kind of crab-like uh, crustacean, whatever. He should have, he bypasses that completely and he should have just been the claws. He feels like a pair of ragged claws used, misused, uh, thrown away, right? Just lurking at the bottom, right? Bottom feeders, right? Crabs, that's all they're looking for is just kind of what remains. And this is what he should have been, scuttling across the floors of silent seas. He's being quite honest. He wants to remain silent. This is what he should have been. Um, and just kind of scuttling along. This is not the good, a very good buildup of the type of character needed to propose, right? So this feels like a deflation before we go into the next section here, right? What he should have been. Uh, beautiful image, right? When you uh, take it into account. All right. <clears throat> In this next stanza, beginning with line 75, uh, we get a, another reference to routines. And, and again, maybe even more pleasant. We talked about the coffee, we talked about the sugar, we talked about the other things. And this is tea and cakes and ices. Ices being ice cream, I think, right? Their way of saying ice cream. And again, like the, the pleasant conveniences and I guess we could call them indulgences of our lives, especially the consumer class, right? Those who have money to spend on these things routinely. And man, I live in Southern California. This kind of stuff is so expensive. Like everywhere you go, food, you know, going out to eat, just going to get some ice cream. I got two young boys and they're, you know, you gotta buy things for everybody at this point, right? And it just adds up. But again, are those conveniences and pleasantries in my life more, are, are they helping me to remain uh, 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 undistracted by all of the unpleasant things of the world, right? Is it easy just to focus on the pleasant? Um, now we get a couple religious references here, and the first one is going to be lines roughly uh, 82 down through 83, I guess. Uh, I, no profit and here's no great matter. Um, he's... Uh, had his head uh, brought in upon a platter. And this is a reference to John the Baptist. He gets his uh, decapitated, right? Ordered to be decapitated by Herod's daughter, King Herod's daughter, who is just kind of really into dancing, I guess, if I remember from the biblical uh, uh, narrative there. But it's to ridicule John. Ridicule him for what? The prophesizing, the foretelling that Christ would come and change things, right? Without saying too much on detail there. But to prophesize the coming of Christ, the, the resurrection, all these things, I believe. Um, he was ridiculed for saying something that not a lot of people wanted to hear, right? And not a lot of people uh, 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 felt compelled to hear uh, uh, or that was even uh, truthful in any regard. So he really went out on a limb and it cost him his life. So King Herod, his family could kind of maintain a sense of power here, right? Uh, over, right, this rising notion of this idea of Jesus Christ and all the changes that that would bring with him, uh, with it. So anyways, it's that idea of saying something risky and then there's a consequence. But at that point, you're a martyr. So that's a good thing, right? That's why all the saints are martyrs, right? They lost their lives in pursuit of some greater kind of goal, right? Some greater idea. And last lines, 85, 86, I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. Eternal footman really is going to be like death, grim reaper. And, and eternal footman <clears throat> is most likely kind of grim reaper, right? Death, the coming of the end of your life. And it's uh, personified here as a footman, which is like the person who will give you your coat, again, speaking to kind of the upper class lifestyle, right? <clears throat> People waiting on you. 
Uh, but of course, ironically, this is death. And maybe even more ironically, the snickering that we see. And when you snicker at somebody, it shows that you're, you're kind of mocking them, ridiculing them, uh, 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 resenting them for, for whatever reason. And so that's not a good thing to see and a feeling to then feel, right, for <clears throat> proof rock here. Uh, the, this idea of death basically ridiculing you. And, um, you know, uh, that's not a good feeling. Um, we want to feel like we've accomplished things in our life before we get to that final end and not have even death, right, this finality of, uh, uh, of time uh, mocking us, right, kind of thinking of us in these ways. And it does create this kind of fear on behalf of proof rock. And maybe this is a great point, getting close to the end of the poem, close enough, I could say, um, to be reminded of that fear, right, that proof rock is feeling here uh, about staying quiet, staying silent, literally not proposing figuratively, not to say what needs to be said here, keeping that kind of general. And moving on, the next uh, stanza here, it's expanded to marmalade, tea, again, all of the pleasant conveniences that we build into a routine, right? That we stick to day in, day out, week by week, month by month, year by year. You even get a mention of porcelain. You think about what that, why would we get the, the reference to porcelain? It kind of takes us back to Greek, kind of Roman civilization, right? And when you think about the Renaissance, we are very much tied to that part of the world, right? Those. Uh, where we, we, we talk about these great points of human achievement. Um, but it's also something very delicate and perhaps something you'd even see at this party, right? Maybe as decorative display or something like that. But it's also something very fragile and, and delicate all the same. So there's lots of different uh, uh, kind of ideas that we can have uh, about the reference to the porcelain. Um, we get a reference to Lazarus. This is another biblical reference. And this is when Jesus, without knowing too much or saying too much about this, uh, illusion, <clears throat> Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. There is that direct connection to Dante essentially coming back from hell, in a way coming back from seeing what would be this kind of permanent death uh, for so many people, right? This, this, this afterlife that they're living. Um, but we, we can make those connections, right? Uh, and he even says, uh, I come back to tell you, I shall tell you all. And I love it how a poet can leave something very vague. Well, tell, tell us all, tell us all of everything. Well, what is this that you, you're going to tell us? And of course, he doesn't really mention it, but it's for us to kind of fill in those blanks, right? Um, to come back from the dead, to see these things, to see this part of humanity, to know these things as certainties, right, about people. And um, I'm ready to tell you all of these things, right? Um, share this. And maybe that's what this poem is, is, is kind of sharing the unfortunate things that Prufrock has kind of experienced and seen, right? And we're getting all of that. Um, all right. <clears throat> the next stanza, starting with line, uh, let's see here. I think it's either 99 or 100. Is it worth it to destroy the comfort, uh, the comfort of an affluent life? Is it worth it? Why would you want to disturb that? Why would you want to destroy that? right? Um, and we get that with the sunsets. We get that with the door yards and sprinkled streets. This is the exact opposite of where we begin uh, with this poem when we're out in kind of the more seedier parts of town, right? More run down. They seem to be. Here we have the affluent, right? Uh, with the perfect manicured yards and door fronts and everything looks so pristine, right? Like we see in the real estate websites and magazines, right? Another one is thrown in here in terms of this comfort routine, this convenience that is a major part of the uh, upper and middle class people's lives, right? Kind of reminds you historically of like the bourgeoisie, right? And some of these groups that emerge uh, throughout history. The novels, the reading, right? That we read in order to fill up our brains with a certain sense of ourselves that just kind of brings us into the future, right? We will we'll never shed these feelings about what it means to be from a certain civilization, right? Because we are constantly reading about, you know, in a way being just kind of conditioned, maybe even propagandized, uh, to believe that all of these ideas uh, that we share, kind of common, common ideas, are valid, right? That, th that they really are kind of virtuous. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe the content of these novels needs to change. And of course, that's a big part of this uh, poem, right? With the advent of modernism in writing. Um, we have to see reality for what it is and kind of respond without this 
idealism, right? This, this way we wish we could be. Moving on, um, we get a strange uh, 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 image here. I mean, I think maybe one, the strangest image in the whole poem. Uh, and we get it th it's through simile, as if a magic lantern. So we get this idea to like supernatural and magical and mystical, right? Um, this mythological perhaps, but this uh, magic lantern. And that's a nice kind of uh, preview or even segue into some more supernatural references that we'll have at the end, which will be the mermaids, right? We get these, uh, 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 this reference couple references I guess you could say to the mermaids and what is this magic lantern doing well it's throwing nerves and patterns and when you think nerves I think you have to think about like the you know that the dendrons and the dendrites and the way they branch out and the nerves throughout our body because I think that's I think that's what he has in, in mind here and he wants to take those images of those nerves and throw it up on a screen and you know even in 1920 when this poem is published in that era, people are seeing things on screens, right? It's probably quite phenomenal for them, right? Back then, compared to us, we're highly saturated, right? With uh, screens every with screens everywhere, right? Always uh, watching things. Um, but he's going to throw it up there. Maybe that speaks to society, right? That's where they'll see it, right? Is on the screen. That's the only way you're going to get the attention, perhaps, of certain classes of people right in a society whether it be england remember he's kind of writing out of london at this time post world war one um but we could be thinking about america right southern california is where i'm at uh southern california uh in the year 2024 here right are people still in need of seeing this pattern of nerves on a screen right amidst everything else that they might be seeing as well and to think about nerves, I think it's like it really just gets literal for me at least um, to get on somebody's nerves, to make them think about something, right? To make them have to really think and ponder and maybe even question their own feelings and, and, and values, right? But to put those nerves right, right on the screen. Um, and maybe that's what he wants to do, right? It's to get us to really feel, or, or I should say maybe at least think about some issues. And he, re he kind of mentions that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. It seems to be like all this building up of a certain direction and even toward a certainty, like this is the way I see things, right? This is the feeling that I have. It all reverses, right? In those last couple lines, that is not what I meant at all. And I think it just speaks to what he's already mentioned, revision, indecision. Uh, and he gets into a lot more detail here in the final section, which I think if you have a little bit of background on Hamlet, then you're set up a little bit for this because you at least know the plot of Hamlet, right? And, and how, to, how to think about this character. And he starts off, Proofrock, <clears throat> Proofrock is not Hamlet. You could put that on a t-shirt. I don't know how cool that is, but it's, 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 a, it's a clear statement, right? Proofrock is not Hamlet and he's not meant to be. So they, I think this is kind of a, a, a point of despondency and despair. It feels a little defeated because if you know anything about Hamlet, he does save the day, right? By the end of that play. And I don't want to spoil anything. I'm just getting ready to teach it to my AP students uh, in just a few days, right? We're going to start reading. Um, but he does. He's kind of that, that, that victorious hero by the end of it, right? He does what he has to do. Uh, what... Proofrock is saying is, I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to do what needs to be done. And then he gives us detail. And I'll just point out a couple of the uh, words here. Basically, sees himself as like a bit character, an attendant lord, not like the main star of the show who might do something virtuous, but just a bit character. Deferential. What does it mean to defer? It means to like just... I'll just go with somebody else's opinions. I do this when I buy stuff on Amazon, I feel like. I'll just read people's reviews, and if there's a lot of them and they're, they're praising something, I will just go with what they're saying and I'll just buy that thing, right? Or maybe you do this at home with loved ones. You just defer to their own opinions on certain things, whether it be sports, whether it be politics, whether it be uh, uh, things going on in your professional or school life, right? Whatever. We just defer to other people's opinions, right? We just take their word for it. Um, another one that stands out here, politic, which means like to operate in a world of politics and have to be very cautious and, you know, kind of understand the, the terrain you are treading, right? 
um, and just be aware and smart, I guess you could say in some ways. Always be thinking about how to get ahead or to have your own interest or whatever interest you're working in further, right? Maybe more over others, right? There's a lot that goes into that, I'm sure, right? To be politic. And he's saying he is that, but there is that kind of back and forth to it. And there's a couple more words, cautious, which speaks for itself, and meticulous means to be just too into the fine details of things. It could be a good thing. It's good to be meticulous on some stuff, right? Many people would tell you, but it also can be bad in the sense that it prevents us from accomplishing or, or completing something, right? We just get caught up in the meticulousness of it, right? The fine, fine details, always revising, changing, whatever it could be. Can't get over this one little thing. And a couple other words, obtuse means just confusing, unclear, right? You can't, can't really understand it. And that's uh, ironic because it's mixed with high sentence. I got really important things to say. It's just they're going to be shrouded in this kind of confused jargon, perhaps, my, my expression of it, right? No one will understand me. And we arrive at the fool. That's how he really feels, right? At times I feel the fool. And that's exactly when you get to the end of Hamlet, final act. Um, that's kind of how, that's what Hamlet's dealing with, right? Am I the fool or am I something different? And that's where you get the whole skull of Yorick, right? Which is the jester. And Hamlet understands he's, he's kind of been raised by a fool in some ways. And, and it has prevented him from being more like his father, right? Uh, who is very, very virtuous in terms of maintaining power, being uh, an obedient husband, right? And a caring, loving husband. So he's got some virtues to him that, that Hamlet just can't live up to. So that's where Prufrock ends. He's almost reversed the story of Hamlet, right? At least within that final act. We will end the fool here. And it brings us in his mind. Remember, literally, he's still at this party. He's still thinking about proposing. But we basically are transported to his mind. And we're out on the beach. And he's gotten old. So he's in this kind of apprehension and anxiety of not being able to say what he wants to say or propose the way he wanted to propose. He has grown old. Okay. Uh, and do I dare eat a peach? Line 122, peach is immortality. I'll let you apply that if you need to in, any, in, in some kind of way, right? But the idea of immortality here. Um, white flannel trousers, it speaks, it, it sounds very pristine. It sounds quite pure, right? And walk upon the beach. So maybe that white is important here. You'll see other colors show up here at the very end. And now we get the mermaids. And when we do the mermaids, um, the first thing to mention here is to take the Disney stuff, as awesome as it is, and to kind of brush that off to the side for a moment. Because the one you want to be con really concerned with here, the reference would be to the real Greek mythology of mermaids, which is um, to beautiful, right? Beautiful uh, uh, and alluring, right? They were described as being naked, right? Half female, human, and then fish, right? Kind of fish. Um, but beautiful from the waist up, alluring, and of course, beautiful voices, right? The beautiful songs they would sing. And I think it's similar to like sirens from Nordic culture, right? Their mythology. Um, so just to make that, that point. Now, they, what do they do after that? They, they lure in the sailors, and the sailors, you know, are, 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 they're only human. We can, we, that's one way we can put it. And so they are very much captivated uh, by the mermaids, and they get closer and closer to the point where it feels like they're going to kiss, perhaps, or at least embrace. And then what do the mermaids do, according to real Greek mythology? They pull the sailor into the water and then eat them. They're cannibals, right? So the mermaids here, it's worth noting, really uh, uh, kind of give us a present danger, right? This real element of danger that we get. And things have felt dangerous. I think there's all kinds of elements of danger and intrigue even, right, throughout this, this poem. But this is a real danger because they will pull you into the water and then they will eat you, right? This cannibalistic ways of the mermaids. So what's happening here? <clears throat> He's on the beach 
and the mermaids are singing to each other. And the only other music you should be thinking about at this point is the music that was passing from the party. Uh, remember the the void, the music covering up the dying voice of the voice is dying in a dying fall or whatever it was. Um, there's the music, right? The captivating, alluring music of this party where these affluent people are right doing their thing and Prufrock is on the verge of proposal and we see how crazy this is really driving him, right? Because there's so much more at stake. It's more than just a proposal, right? But anyways, the mermaids are singing to each other. There's that kind of cacophony of you know, uh, uh, the Enlightenment, uh, the Renaissance, hearkening back to the Renaissance and Michelangelo, human greatness, right? The music we get caught up with that seems to just solidify that fact, right? That whole representation in our mind of our civilization and how great it is. Um, and I think that's what the singing is because here's the next line. I do not think that they will sing to me. And while that sounds very isolating to not be a part of that music, Almost like being at the party and not feeling like you really belong in these rooms. The women come and go, speaking, you know, speak, uh, talking of Michelangelo. Um, even though that sounds very sad and isolating, I think this is where the hope and the victory for proof rock exists, right? It, it's where we find it, which is he's not falling victim to that alluring sense of who we are, right? Based on old examples, right? That we have completely outlived and, and really changed as a humanity since then, when we start to really assess the world around us. And I know I've said that, that phrase so much, you know, we, we, it's kind of peaked at this point, but it's important to note that, right? You're not buying into it, right? You're not buying into the sense of a victorious and virtuous civilization any longer. Right, it's time to take a very realistic look. And again, what does Prufrock say? Come, come with me. Just like Virgil, bringing Dante into the 13 layers, right? Which is almost to say hell is earth in some respects, right? Which is not such a great notion. Um, we're looking at the mermaids. They're out into the ocean, right? The combing the white hair of the waves blown black. So you do get this contrast of white and black. Again, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, uh, what to make of that in terms of meaning here. Is it really just literal or do you look into it a little bit more? And they're out there, they're just kind of swimming away. He feels very alone, but uh, cut off uh, from uh, those influences. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe there's a, this, this new chance now, right? To start really having a sense of how the world is. And then it ends almost on a cautionary note, but, but too little too late. Um, we're in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown. Beautiful line. Um, and sea girls, notice it was mermaids, which had that alluring, captivating sense, right? Uh, of, of a certain kind of grandeur and romantic quality. And so it's, now it's sea girls, right? We're, we're seeing past the, the mystical nature of it, right? We're seeing past the romantic nature of it. And now it's sea girls, there's something clearly human about it. Just like we living in this world are clearly human and therefore it speaks to real human circumstances, right? The results that we have to live with based on human behavior, right? It's all a part of being a human being here and, and seeing these mermaids for what they truly are. And they're even wreathed with seaweed red and brown. Make, the, make of the colors what you will. Uh, but it really is almost a for me, uh, a ghastly image, right? Where uh, definitely doing away with perhaps uh, the more romantic vision of the mermaid upon the rocks looking as stellar as can be here. Uh, it's, it's seen for what it truly is, right? Uh, something that almost has this insidious quality to it, right? When voices wake us and we drowned. This is where we get a sense that it's too little too late, right? Till human voices wake us and we drowned. Notice we just had the sea girls. It's a transition from like mermaids to sea girls now to fully human, right? And it's going to be the human voices. And that could be quite endearing too. The actual human voices of our societies, right? That are calling out, figuratively speaking, of course, but literally as well in pain, right? And suffering. You know, you think about coming out of World War I, other economic issues throughout the world, et cetera, exploitation, right, et cetera. Um, we're gonna hear all that, 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 that uh, 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 
chaos, right? We're going to hear all of those voices. We're going to hear all of that. And it's going to wake us up away from the alluring sounds of the music, right, that have kept us kind of numb. I guess we go back all the way to the very beginning of the poem, right? Like a patient etherized upon the table. It's that numbness will be finally revived from that numbness only to drown, right? Um, it's not really left to be considered here. There is ultimately just a drowning that takes place, which is unfortunate. It does kind of seem to be prophesized by the allusion to, uh, the initial allusion to Dante's Inferno, because what's the whole premise of that book? People wind up in hell, right? And even if you don't believe in that, uh, obviously a lot of people don't, right, uh, believe in hell, uh, an actual like existing of place, you know, existing place. Um, it's still so wrapped up in just theme and, and, and the kinds of people that wind up there and ideas of redemption and living virtuous lives. So it's, it's all incredibly thematic, right? But in the end, we're all going down, right? We're all drowning here, perhaps with the mermaids as, as well, which is never a good thing, right? When you think about the treacherous nature of these mermaids as represented through different aspects throughout this poem. All right. Hope this was a, uh, a help. Uh, this is such a rich poem uh, to dive into. Uh, I think a great poem to teach. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we maybe take for granted. Uh, it's hard to say how people reacted to this, you know, uh, uh, many, many, many decades ago. Um, but um, I think this, this, this really is an important poem in terms of setting a certain kind of uh, uh, vision in place, right? How we see the world, how we express a certain kind of feeling for the world, and trying to have a certain social commentary, right? Because there's obviously, I think, uh, a good amount of social commentary wrapped up in Eliot's poem here. Thank you, and I look forward to doing uh, some more poetry uh, in the near future. Have a good day.